You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone. Welcome to Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. And this program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and 37 congregations of the Churches of Christ in a four state area. You'll see their names at the end of our program today and we encourage you to worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. Now we have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hi, my name is Andy Brewer and I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Rick Knoll and I preach for the Oak Ridge Church of Christ in Obion, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Chris Lydon. I'm the evangelist at the Hardin Church of Christ in Hardin, Kentucky. These brethren have been doing a great job uh, this month answering questions and we're very happy to have them with us. Our first question today goes to Brother Rick Knoll. How do we answer the question, where did God come from? Who made God? Brother Noel. When I first got this question, I thought, how many times have I heard this question asked of myself in classes and such? And, and this question has always been asked in these many different ways. And for some, whatever answer you give them, it's just not going to satisfy some people. There are those that just do not believe in God whatsoever. There are those that think there's a higher being, but they're not sure of that either. They just, they just can't put their finger on it. But I'd like to go to what the Bible has to say on this. And, and the first passage of Scripture I'd like to look at is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And the Bible simply begins with, In the beginning, God. So from that statement right there, it indicates to me that God has always existed. That that's the very beginning point. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. This indicates He's always been. And everything that we know about God is contained within God's Word. God has revealed to us just certain things, and, and we're going to have to be content with those things and with the evidences that are out there. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the Roman brethren, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19, he said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. God has shown proof of His existence. God has demonstrated His love for mankind through the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins on Calvary's cross. We look at the world around us and we sit in amazement at all the many functions of things that go on out there that continue, the seasons continue. We know that there's uh, spring, winter, fall, and and, and, and summer, and sometimes they come real close together here of late, it seems like, in this area. Uh, we, we notice also that, that the Scriptures declare the handiwork of God. The psalmist in Psalms 19 and verse 1, the psalmist David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. And who can't but help but wonder of the things around us, of how that the planet stays in its orbit on its axis, how that we get the sunshine and that the sun and the moon is set just so far from the sun that the earth is warmed and cooled at the same time. We notice also that when the scriptures are telling us these things that in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, for the invisible things from, of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The things that are out there explain how God is and who God is and what He can do. It doesn't necessarily tell us how He was made or who made God or how He was created. We accept the fact that God states that He does exist and He demonstrates that existence by the things that are around us. The writer in the book of Hebrews, he tells us in verse 1 of that 11th chapter, he said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can see a bench or a chair that was made from wood, and we know that that wood came from a tree. It didn't just appear by itself. We know that there are different things that are out there that, that have appeared and that they came about, and it's by those natural processes and how that the, the Lord has, has blessed us with all these many wonderful things. In the third verse of that same chapter, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that, 
things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so God has, has shown us. He's, he's blessed us with these things. He's helped us out to understand these things. He doesn't expect us to have faith in Him without the proper evidence. He wants us to know. Now, there are some things that God just has not revealed to us. Uh, who His Creator was, if there was such, I don't believe that. I think God has always existed. But in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, and this is a passage of Scripture that I always like to look at because there are so many other questions, other things that I would like to know that God just hasn't revealed to us. And so listen to what the advice is for us. The secret things belong unto the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of His law. I would suggest that we concern ourselves, accept the fact that God does exist by the evidences, and that we accept God and do the things that He's revealed to us, and obey those commandments, and trust in, His, trust in the Lord to deliver us when that judgment day comes after we've been faithful. And thank you very much for that question. Thank you. And now to Brother Lydon. How could a wooden ark survive such a violent universal flood? Brother Lydon. Thank you, Mike. Let's start off by talking about what I don't know. And that could take all day, but we'll just take a few moments. What I don't know is how uh, to build an ark myself. Uh, especially if, if you just piled up a bunch of wood, even gopher wood out here next to me, I, I could not build uh, by myself what, uh, what was built back in that day in Noah's time. Uh, secondly, I, I really don't have any clue on, on the capabilities, the skills, the knowledge of people that lived in Noah's day as far as it was for building uh, these ships or wooden vessels. I, I just don't know. But let's talk about what we can know. There are many things that we can understand. First of all is that we can understand and we can know that God could have granted Noah the knowledge that he needed to build a tremendous vessel, the likes of which we have never seen before in this world. We saw it, we've seen God do this in the Bible where God will grant people knowledge to fulfill uh, some command that he has given. Think about when God ordered the building of the tabernacle in the temple. Oh, some of those elaborate uh, pieces of artwork in there, some of the, the designs, the, the structure of it would be very difficult to do, especially if you were building a tabernacle out in the wilderness. But don't you know that God provided? God, it tells us in Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 through 5, that He uh, took a man and He gave him the proper knowledge. It says in Exodus 31 and verse 3, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and the cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving to, of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. God gave them the knowledge that they needed and the skill to fulfill the command. Now, they could have had no knowledge prior to this, but God gave them the knowledge. We need to understand that God could have given Noah the proper knowledge needed to fulfill the command, to build a wonderful vessel. Second thing, God has power over nature, and in particular water. We've seen that with the flood. We've seen it when God told the Israelites and Moses to cross the Red Sea. He parted the waters. Later on in the book of Joshua, when he told the Israelites to cross over the Jordan River, what happened? Again, God had power over that. He parted the waters, and they walked across on dry land. We know that Jesus in his ministry in Mark chapter 4, there was a great storm and he walked on the water out to his disciples. He had power over nature. He had power over water. You see, the thing here is that God in one instance can be destroying the world through chaos, but in that same moment, he could have a calm place for Noah and all those on the ark. There could be a storm all around them, but yet they are sitting on calm waters. God has power over that. For example, God preserving the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where? In the midst of a burning and fiery furnace, they were preserved. We can think about Daniel in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6, how he was preserved. We can think of Jonah in the stomach of a great fish. God, he could have told Noah to just stack up a bunch of bricks, and he would preserve them on those, those bricks. He could have told him to go down to the local Walmart and grab a pool noodle, 
and He will preserve them on that pool noodle. God has power. He has control to do such thing. And that's a wonderful thought. Isn't it a wonderful thought to know that in the midst of a chaotic life, God has the power to bring peace into my life? And that is truly a wonderful thing to think about. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, Wait Till the Honeymoon. You can have this track or our eight lesson Bible correspondence course or both by contacting us. You can write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll free number at 1-800-436-0463. You can also go to our webpage, and we encourage you to do that. We have a contact page there where you can uh, send us your question or send us your request, and that's at www.abibleanswertv.org. Back to our questions today to Brother Brewer. The person says, if a man is very poor and owes a large debt, does that excuse him from giving to the church? Brother Brewer. Every indication in the New Testament of what, with regard to what God requires uh, in our giving can basically be summed up in two things. Number one, He requires that we do give. And number two, that, that what we give is simply proportionate to what we have. Okay? Now, don't just take my word for that. Let's read a few verses that, that tell us those two facts. Number one, that God wants us to give. And number two, that our giving simply be proportionate to what we have. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so do ye also. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store, as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. He just simply said what they gave just simply needed to be proportionate to what they had. He didn't require a certain amount. It was just simply as they prospered. Secondly, in 2 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 1, Paul wrote, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God, which, he hath, with, which hath been given in the churches of Macedonia, how that in much proof of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, now underline that in your mind, they're not giving out of abundance other, other than their abundance of joy. He said they're giving out of their deep poverty, but how that abounded unto the riches of their liberality. And so even though they were deep in poverty, he said they still gave liberally. For according to their power, I bear witness, yea, and even beyond their power, they gave of their own accord. There is a lot of good in information in those three verses that I wish we had time to, to give more attention to. But notice they gave out of their poverty, yet they gave liberally. They gave of their own accord. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, Paul commanded, Let each man do according as he hath purposed in his heart. Now that's in regard to the same giving that he's addressing in chapter 8. Let him do it according as he hath purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Again, needs to be done and simply needs to be proportionate to what they had. And then one quick last scripture uh, simply comes from the example of the poor widow in Luke 21, where Luke records that as Jesus looked up, saw the rich men that were casting their gifts into the treasury, he saw a certain poor widow casting in just two mites, a very small amount. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you, this poor widow cast in more than they all. Now, how was it that she gave more than the rich who were giving apparently extraordinary sums of money? Jesus answered that question. For all these did of their superfluity cast in unto the gifts... That is, they gave out of their abundance, but she of her want cast in all the living that she had. She gave, 
And that giving was proportionate to what she had. Now, with that behind, we know God's two requirements regarding giving. That we do it and that it simply be proportionate to what we have as we purpose in our heart. I've got a couple of questions about the question itself. The idea that this person in question would just simply be excused from giving altogether. Question number one. In their mind, is their giving the first thing that they're cutting out of their budget? Uh, for instance, or did they decide, well, you know, I'm deep in debt. I don't have a lot of money. Maybe I need to cut off the satellite or the cable before I decide to not give to God. That's a luxury. It's not something we have to have. It might be something we like to have, but it's not something we have to have. Uh, did they decide to cut that out first? What about the cell phone? You know, we, we kind of assume that that's an absolute and this, I can't live without my cell phone, folks. Yes, you can. Uh, we did for a long time before we had them, and it may make life inconvenient. It may, uh, may bring some difficulty that we didn't have before. Folks, we can do without it if we have to. What about the Internet? What about simplifying one's grocery list or, or other items that they purchase throughout the month? Now, there's a lot of things that we can cut out of our budget before we ever get to the point to where I decide I just don't have enough money to give back to God. Uh, so number one, uh, is giving the first thing that they decided to cut out of their budget, uh, is that the first thing they decided they couldn't afford? The second question I have is, is their giving more out of obligation or is it out of opportunity? Uh, back in the verse we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul addressed that. He said, don't give grudgingly or out of necessity. Give cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. Are we giving out of obligation or out of opportunity? Giving is intended to be a reciprocal act of gratitude for what God has given to us. And so by giving nothing back to God... What are we saying about what we think God has given to us? Well, wouldn't that basically uh, conclude that we're saying God has given us nothing and so we're giving Him nothing back in return? Now, it, it may be the case that in this circumstance a person would need to take a close look at how much they are giving to make sure that they can meet all of their ob other obligations, keep that word obligation in mind, We've got to meet our obligations, absolutely. We've got to have money to pay, pay our uh, necessary bills. We've got to have uh, money to, to live, to, to, to supply the necessities of life. Um, and it may be the case that until that debt is paid, that we need to lower the amount that we give to make sure that, that everything is being taken care of. But to say that the man would be excused from giving altogether is a far leap and I don't believe is a conclusion to which we should be able to scripturally come. Giving is a part of our worship to God. And by the way, there's a sacrificial component to the way that we're supposed to give anyway. We're supposed to give sacrificially. Uh, and so it seems to me that in, in a circumstance like this, and this may sound cliche, but I don't intend it to be, a person in this circumstance simply has the ability to trust God more at this moment in their lives than at any other time. Uh, and so there, there may need to be some thought to how much they give, but cutting giving out altogether, I think if that's the first uh, conclusion to which they come or the first thing to which they leap, uh, that might say a little bit about their heart uh, and about their relationship with God. So uh, thank you for that good question, and I hope that helps in some way. Thank you. Brother Noel, the person says, My child is rebellious and refuses to obey me. She is in high school and is threatening to move out. What can I do? Brother Noel. First of all, my heart breaks for you. Uh, it's a sad, sad situation when a child thinks they know more than mom and daddy do and, and decide to go out on their own and try to to ignore what they've been taught or been trained. I know one thing, she's mighty lucky not to have been living during the days of the Mosaical Law because in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 18 beginning, the scriptures plainly teach, 
If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of the father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, bring him out unto the elders of this city, and unto the gates of this place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he dies. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. I don't know how many children would be around anymore the way the, uh, uh, some of them talk to their parents and some of the demands that they've made on their parents and their, the rebellious nature that they have. And it is a sad commentary that, that this is going on. First and foremost, I would suggest to you to be praying. We talked earlier on a question that was answered about praying on those mountains and, and how that we can move that mountain. We can move those barriers if we forcefully pray, if we have that faith and do all that we can to, to do our part to encourage and to teach our children to help show them the error of their way, to not leave and to not do that which would be uh, wrong on their part. Uh, without knowing all the situation, I would have a hard time uh, saying exactly what might be done or should be done. It could very well be that you may need to find somebody that could act as an intermediary or mediator between you and your daughter, uh, maybe between you and your husband and your daughter, so that those things that could be said or done or to be instructing them would help them to come to an understanding of what's needed. Maybe all three of you have something that you need to be taken care of, that there's issues going on that way, uh, that demands that are being made are not reasonable. Uh, too many parents sometimes, they want to just be pals with their children, and they've forgotten that they have certain roles and responsibilities. Mamas and daddies are to be mamas and daddies. Children are to be, to be children, show respect and honor to their parents. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And perhaps that there's been some neglect in that area that, that the child needs to be apologized to because you haven't done that part of your duty and responsibility. Maybe it is that that child has just got that rebellious streak in them and there's nothing that's going to change their mind, that they're just going to go out and strike on their own. Well, in the book of Luke, chapter 15, we have the account of the prodigal son. And that prodigal son went to the father and demanded that the father give him his inheritance. I know, in my mind, that would rub me the wrong way if one of my children would have said that to me. I'd have let them go, but they wouldn't have got no inheritance, that's for sure. Uh, I would ask, I would ask you to think about what all went on. Ultimately, that child, that prodigal son, finally came to himself. He found out that the grass wasn't greener on the other side. He found out those people that he looked upon as perhaps being his friends were not friends after all, that they helped squander the money that he did have to where he got in such a low state and low esteem that he recognized how good he really did have it back at home. It could very well be that your daughter is in that same boat, thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, will not have to worry about mom and daddy telling her what to do anymore because she'll be out on her own. And certainly she may be more mature than, than what I would think based on what I know here. And it could very well be that there's still some growing up and that there still might be time that you might be able to reach out to her and teach her and guide her and help encourage her to come back. But during all this, continue to pray. As a parent, I can feel your agony uh, and anguish if a child is disobedient. And I can feel the hurt in, in just the question, what can I do? And there's times in, in our lives as parents and as grandparents that, that we want our children to do very well in school. We want them to do very well in life. We want them to be good citizens of, of our nation that we live in. But sometimes we may have to do like that prodigal's father, let the child go and let them learn that, you know, when I'm out on my own, I have to make my own money. When I'm out on my own, I'm going to have to get my own job. When I'm out on my own, I'm going to have to pay my own rent. When I'm out on my own, I'm going to have to pay my own car insurance. I'm going to have to buy my own gas. I'm going to have to buy my own food. I'm going to have to pay those car payments and pay that insurance. There's a lot of expenses that are involved in living on your own and running away from home. 
And certainly maybe that lesson can be taught to them before it's too late as well. I know also that when the prodigal son finally came to himself, and, and I'm praying that that will be the case with your daughter, that she'll come to herself before it's too late. In the last part of that 15th chapter of the book of Luke, these, these precious words of that father, he said in verse 32, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. The thing that I really see are the outstretched arms of that father <clears throat> welcoming that child home. And you've got to be ready to do the very same thing. You cannot give up on your child, and you need to do everything in your power to bring them back home. And I thank you for the question. Thank you very much to Brother Brewer and to Brother Noel and to Brother Lydon for doing such a great job today in uh, answering your questions. Uh, this last question, of course, touches our heart, and we pray for this family. So many families are in crisis today and having so many troubles, but we need to turn to the Word of God for all the help that we can get. You know, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, Joshua said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. God told Joshua that the key to success, the key to prosperity uh, in his work of getting himself and the people of Israel to the promised land was to use the Word of God as a standard. He was to think on that. He was to talk about it. He was to meditate on it. That method will work for us as well in our journey through life. That method will work for us in our homes. And if our goal is to make it to the promised land of heaven and take as many with us as can, then we need to get into the book and we need to read it and we need to love it and we need to teach it, to teach it to others. And that's what we're about here at A Bible Answer. We're very glad that you've watched A Bible Answer today. We hope you'll remember that for your questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.